In this video, we narrow down on the topic of photography and discuss the interesting subject of licensing. Now, while I have had experience with licensing my photos over the past few years, by no means would I consider myself an expert per se. That's why I wanted to bring on an expert to discuss licensing. If you're a photographer and have perused social media pretty much any time over the past few months, you may have come across ads from this guy, Adam Taylor. Adam is an architectural and interiors photographer currently based in Hawaii, but within the photographer community, he's kind of become known as the licensing guy, mostly due to his online course, Learn to License Your Photos. Now, while we do discuss some aspects of his course, this video by no means is a commercial. This video is not sponsored by Adam, and I don't get anything in return if you happen to want to get his course after watching this video. In fact, I'm the one who reached out to him to set this up because to many photographers, the topic of licensing their work still has many elements of mystery and confusion, and it can even be a contentious issue when it's brought up to some clients. Now, I'll be frank, there were a couple questions where I was expecting kind of generic answers back from Adam, and he actually came back with some pretty on the nose specifics. So I really think you're going to enjoy this interview. Now, if by chance you are interested in his course, Adam does provide a pretty significant discount code that he mentions at the very, very end. So if you wanna to get to the meat of the discussion, then I encourage you to fast forward to this time. But we started off the interview talking about his move from Long Beach, California, all the way to Hawaii. So Long Beach wasn't tropical enough for you. And then you decided I need to go to Hawaii. <laughs> Why of all places Hawaii? I mean, I, I it's an obvious question, but yeah, why did you guys pick Hawaii? Uh, how far do we want to go back on here? But my wife and I had a vision board and we started writing out and, you know, posting pictures of all the things that we wanted in our life. Uh, and some of those things were free diving and snorkeling, um, like jungle hikes to waterfalls, paddle boarding, kind of like this outdoor adventurous lifestyle. Uh, and one of the places that we really fell in love with that had all those things was Bali, Indonesia. And originally we had actually planned to move to Bali uh, right before COVID hit. Uh, we had a one-way flight. We had a house rented out there. We were gonna live there for at least a year. Uh, we had our visas in place. I mean, I had sold my computer and my desk and my chair and sold our dining set. And like 10 days before our flight out to Bali is when COVID hit and California oh, shut down. So uh, all year in 2020, we were like, okay, well, what can give us the lifestyle that we're dreaming of and was on our vision board. And so we kind of went down the checklist of like, okay, does this place have everything we need? And eventually it was like, well, Hawaii has it all. Uh, both my wife and I had both been here two times independently of each other. And we're like, you know what? We know this is the kind of life that we want. So let's just send it in and go for it. Nice. So if, I mean, if you're gonna take a snapshot of your life, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, you think you'll still be in, in Hawaii or do you think you'll, is, is Bali still on that list? No, Bali's not really on the list because again, the things that were drawing us to Bali, we have here. Gotcha. Um, so never say never. I mean, I thought I would never leave <laughs> Long Beach, but that was because 15 years ago, my life was completely different than what it is today. Yeah. Uh, and my goals and dreams were different. So if my goals and dreams and our you know vision for our, what, our, what we want our lifestyle to look like changes, then we could potentially move. Um, but you know, for the foreseeable future, uh, we have a daughter that's four, you know, probably at least oh, until nice. she's out of high school. Um, yeah. You know, this is home. Very cool. So you've, you've done something that I think a lot of, I would say photographers are not hesitant, but I mean, I'm, I guess I'm speaking more personally, if we ever, you know, you kick around the idea of, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we moved somewhere? And like my, my wife is in the medical field, so it's like, oh, she would easily find a job somewhere else. And then the caveat is always, oh yeah, we would love to move to X, Y, Z, but I'm a freelance, you know, self-employed photographer. I'd have to start my business all over again. You obviously did that. So what were some of the challenges and how did you accomplish that? Because I would assume things are rocking and rolling for you. Um, I mean, rocking and rolling is relative, right? Um, <laughs> we are staying afloat. We're making our bills every month and yeah. we're saving and investing money. So things are going great. They can always go better. You know, sure. uh, do I wish I had a photo shoot for tomorrow? Of course. Um, but luckily, and obviously we'll talk about this later, I can also license my photos and other people's photos um, on the side as well. Um, great segue there. Um, but as far as starting over, uh, again, we had this, this vision of what we want our life to look like. And essentially it came down to, are we willing to quote unquote risk it to achieve the lifestyle that we desire? And the answer was yes. 
Uh, and so I sort of like, you know, pick the phrase bet on yourself. Yeah. I know my skills are there. I know that uh, I'm a hustler at heart. Um, I know I have a strong work ethic. Um, and I know that there's enough buildings on this island uh, to be photographed, you know. Uh, obviously, we had a little bit of money and savings to kind of help us out and make sure that it wasn't, you know, starting with zero dollars in the bank when we landed here. Um, but that was the big thing was like, look at your why and try to figure out like, okay, is that strong enough to overcome everything else? And like I said, for us, it was. Are you, uh, are you quoting Simon Sinek there as far as uh, find your why? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, that okay. doesn't sound to ring a bell, no, but I'm he, sure a lot of people a, say that. Yeah, he, he wrote a book uh, like find your why or so, something along those lines, like just kind of focusing on that motivation or mm-hmm. why you're doing something helps you to continue on. But yeah, even people who haven't read the book, I've heard that quite a bit, you know, just keep focusing on the reason why you're doing something. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask kind of a question of a photographer, like say as well established as you are moved into Kansas city, you know, for lack of a better term, I think you would ruffle some feathers. You know, you're, you're a professional, well-established photographer who's got an amazing portfolio did, have you connected with other photographers in the Hawaii area? Have you gotten kickback or they welcome you with open arms or or have you talked with any photographers out in Hawaii at all? Good question. Uh, <laughs> first of all, thank you for the compliments. Before I came here, I specifically did zero research on potential clients and potential competition because I was afraid that if I looked at either one of those things, it would deter me from wanting to come here. And I, I didn't want that. anything to kind of derail our plan. Uh, once I got here, obviously I started, you know, trying to find the potential clients and the leads and, you know, poke around at other potential competition. Um, I don't think there's a ton of competition that their quality of work is as high quality of, as mine. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's not to toot my own horn, but, you know, when I'm just kind of trying to compare like apples to apples and seeing like who's out there in the market, um, you know, I think I'm, I'm up there at the top as far as the Hawaiian Islands go. Um, I have not connected with other photographers at this point. Maybe it's a little bit of like, you know, I'm quote unquote afraid uh, for lack of better words. Like, you know, I don't want to ruffle feathers. Um, Maybe, maybe some of these guys know that I'm here by now. I'm not really sure. Um, Like I said, we haven't connected. Uh, We're all probably vying for the same type of clients, but at the same time, like who knows, like, you know, just because I see somebody's Instagram, that doesn't give me a whole idea of what their entire business model and, and their life looks like. They might be trying to do something completely different than what I'm trying to do. So. Uh, no, I haven't connected with anybody yet. Not to say that I won't, but just haven't yet. Yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming outside of work, you guys are just having a blast then out in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, to put it in a nutshell, like one of our big goals of moving here was make every day of our life feel like a vacation. And I mean, it, it honestly does. Uh, I mean, just rattling off like the last couple of days, I, I went free diving, I think five times in the last like nine or 10 days. Uh, you know, that was taken off two days last week when I didn't have photo shoots or anything and just take off during the day to go diving. Uh, this weekend we went on a hike and then went snorkeling in a different place that I'd never been to before. Uh, it, it's endless, man. And I, every time we go somewhere and do something, we're just like blown away at how much we realize like we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of what there is to do here. Well, that's great. So for other people who are watching this, we've pretty much alienated them because uh, they're not living as well as you are. <laughs> well, I, again, I, I appreciate that. And I take that as a compliment because, again, like this was our big goal, right? Like, yeah. and, and part of our mission in life is to help and motivate and inspire other people. So, you know, we really intend, my wife and I intend to live a life that other people can look at and say, man, like, how are they doing that? How could I do this? You know, maybe they don't necessarily want to live on an island, but maybe they have other goals and dreams that they're chasing. And, you know, I would love to give other people a perspective of, Life doesn't have to be A, B, and C or X, Y, and Z. Like you can make your life however you want it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, especially with, um, being, you know, freelance or, or, or self-employed, there is this sense of, well, I mean, if you asked a hundred people, 90 to 95 of them would say, oh yeah, I'd love to work for myself. Now the percentage of people who would actually do it is I would assume a minority of people, but you know, it's, and people ask, uh, they've asked me, I'm sure they've asked you, other people who want to be, you know, professionals or, or whatever, uh, freelance, hey, when's the perfect time to, or when should I start my own business? I, I mean, my answer is just do it, <laughs> you know, to, to quote Nike. I mean, there, there really is never a perfect time. 
Uh, I mean, are, are you kind of in the, the same boat a, a, after a while? You just kind of have to take a leap and, and do it? Or are you pretty methodical in plotting um, stuff out? I'm definitely very intentional. Um, I'm not like plan for the perfect time. That's definitely not it at all. Uh, my career started back in 2006 after I graduated college. Uh, I got a job working for a BMX bike riding magazine. Yeah. That's kind of where my professional world started. Uh, and I was with them for five and a half years. And throughout that time, I kind of knew like fairly early on that I just didn't make a great employee and that, you know, I, I kind of wanted something different out of life. And so I would kind of make the pros and cons list of like, okay, what is this job providing me with? And what would I get if I left and went on my own and, you know, write the pros and cons for each. And essentially it just got to the point for me where the cons outweighed the pros or whatever. And yeah. I was like, okay, well, it's time for me to go. Um, it was a big leap of faith, you know? Um, but at the same time, at that point, like I said before, like I kind of bet on myself. I knew my skill set. I knew my work ethic. Um, I had done the pros and cons list enough times to know, okay, I've got the network in place that I can find this type of work. And, uh, you know, I've got a, enough savings in place for whatever I need. Um, and then as far as coming here, it was kind of the same thing, you know, like we had saved up for this kind of uh, move. Um, and again, it's just like working on your skill set. Like if you've got a skill set that's transferable, whether that be from California to Hawaii or from the BMX industry to the fitness industry, like I kind of did before, it's like, again, you should already know in your heart if you can make this work. But I will say it takes a very distinct personality type to make it work. Uh, and I don't necessarily think it's for everybody. Yeah. I mean, some people would say you even have to be a little bit nuts. <laughs> to, <laughs> to, Maybe. To do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that, that does transition a little bit into kind of the, the main topic. You, you were talking about your experience with, with uh, BMX. And I've, I've listened to some of your, your inter interviews before. And I guess kind of the cliff notes of it. You were a, a photographer at one point for, were you hired directly by a specific so company or were you completely freelance doing that? Yeah, I worked for a BMX magazine for five and a half years. That's right. Uh, um, full time, you know, staff. My title was associate online editor. So before me, there was nobody running their website. I came in 2006 when, you know, websites were becoming an important part of the publication industry. Uh, so, you know, I started doing their uh, online content, interviews, stories, event coverage, articles, uh, you name it. So that included photography. And then, uh, you know, as YouTube and you know, streaming videos came around, like learning the video production side and filming videos as well. Um, so after I left there, after five and a half years, I was still freelance in the BMX industry for a couple of years and, you know, just working for various clients. And those would include like Red Bull, DC Shoes, Fox um, Clothing Company, Monster Energy, um, you know, different other magazines around the world. So where did you originally get the idea or I guess to license your photos to some of these companies. And the reason I ask is because I know there's still a decent amount of photographers, even professional ones who have been in it for an you know, extended period of time. The idea of licensing is somewhat foreign mm -hmm. to them. So how were you introduced to it, to it? Or did you even kind of know you could do that from the start with your camera? Good question. Um, it's hard to remember like the, the very early days in the BMX industry, but it definitely started then because, you know, for example, the magazine uh, would send me to the X Games or a big competition like Dew Tour, and I would come back with all these photos from the event and companies would reach out and say, hey, my rider, uh, you know, this is a company that sponsored a rider. So just throwing a name out there like sure. Fox Clothing or Monster Energy. Hey, uh, we know you were at the event. My rider ended up on the podium. Do you have any photos of my rider? We're gonna use them for a magazine ad or a poster or a catalog or a congratulations press release, whatever it might be. And so in the BMX world, um, you know, there wasn't that many photographers and especially not that many at each specific event. So companies kind of knew who to come to. So I, I think in the early days, it was definitely companies coming to me. Um, and then it, you know, because again, I, I'm a bit of a hustler, I would say, uh, because my salary wasn't very, very high at the magazine. You know, I would go to events with the idea of like, okay, well, I know X, Y, and Z companies bought photos from me before. Let me make sure I get a couple extra shots of their riders, action, candid, like kind of stage portraits with the course in the background. Or even if it wasn't at a competition, just like at a local a, a jam or event or, you know, just out riding around with, with these professional riders that, as I did all the time. Um, and so that's kind of how it started in BMX. And then when I, you know, fast forward several years, transitioned into real estate, which turned into more of the architecture and design side of things, I was working uh, on retainer with a brick and tile manufacturer. And with them, you know, I would go into a person's house, a restaurant, a bar, whatever it was, and 
photograph the space while really focusing on their tiles or their bricks. Okay. And so it was very marketing driven. Um, you know, I was working very closely with the marketing department there and they had specific needs and uses for these images. Um, and at a certain point, I shot a photo of a fireplace and as I was editing the photo, uh, the fireplace had the bricks all surrounding it. And when I was editing the photo, I saw the logo on the fireplace for the name of the fireplace company. And I was like, oh, well, you know, if this brick company wants this photo, maybe this fireplace company wants the same kind of image. And that's kind of like the early days of when the light bulb started to click in my head for, you know, the architectural interior photos. Um, and so I found a contact, reached out to the fireplace company, and they ended up buying one or two photos from me. And around the same time, I posted a photo on Instagram that I shot for that same tile company that I worked for. And it, their tiles uh, that I shot were on the floor, and there was a different company's tiles on the backsplash. And when I posted that photo on Instagram, the other tile company reached out to me to ask if they could buy it. And so again, oh, wow. the wheel started to turn, and I was like, <laughs> oh man, like every one of these products, like the countertops, the cabinets, the faucet, like, oh my God, there's so many products in every space that I go to. All of these companies need photos. And again, keep in mind, I was working very closely with a tile company. So I saw firsthand and like, you know, behind the scenes of how much they needed the photos, how much they were willing to pay for them, all yeah. the different use cases they had for them. And at that, that point, it was like the floodgates open and I was like, oh man, like I'm sitting on a gold mine here. And then it was off to the races. Well, you, you said, I think it was in another interview, you said self-admittedly there was a gap where you almost felt bad for not kind of applying the licensing principles you had used before, correct? Yeah. Like it was almost a, you go, oh man, why couldn't, <laughs> why didn't I do yeah. this? <laughs> yeah, it, it was kind of like, uh, like, like you said, like hit your forehead, like duh, yeah. like what have you been doing this whole time? Um, but, you know, again, it was relatively new, um, new industry, new people, and really the new skill set, like, you know, transitioning from shooting action sports and live fitness events like the CrossFit Games, like I did, to shooting, you know, a house or a room, a restaurant, a bar, whatever, uh, totally different. And so I think I was just so focused on, you know, just kind of bettering my craft that it didn't really hit me at that time. Yeah. So you, you actually were not, you know, a necessarily a real estate photographer, for very long, correct? You just didn't. Not, not for very long. I, I did it for a while. So, um, I, you know, I set up a, a website for real estate. I, you know, went around and did enough, barely enough just to get a portfolio. I scraped a bunch of emails and just blasted out emails and got hired enough. And at one point, um, a pretty high end uh, real estate brokerage in Orange County, California, um, you know, picked me up and they were hiring me like several times a week and they basically they were keeping me afloat for a while with like, you know, my bread and butter. Yeah. Um, but I kind of quickly learned that I just, it, it wasn't for me, like the business model of shoot several houses in one day and get in and get out and back into the corner and use a wide lens and make the room look big. Uh, it just wasn't for me. And so, and it was taking a long time. Like I wasn't like, you know, get in and out in 20 minutes and edit in 20 minutes. And even with you know, sending my photos off to an overseas editor, I felt like I was just working around the clock and yeah. that kind of just like grinded out like day in, day out. It just wasn't for me. So I, I experimented with a bunch of different things. Like I said, the outsourcing the editing, in-camera HDR, lowering my price on the packages, like higher my price. I mean, I tried all kinds of stuff and I just, it just wasn't for me. And, um, you know, about that time, I was not really sure what I wanted to do because I knew that I enjoyed that, but I honestly, again, one of these like hit your head moments, like I was too naive to even realize that you could shoot interior design or architecture for designers and architects. I thought, you know, if you're in a house, you're shooting for the real estate agent, that's it. Yeah. And so I kind of had my blinders on. So I did a, a handful of just random gigs here and there um, and, you know, kind of floated around and did freelance things and picked up little gigs, yada, yada. Uh, and eventually I started to look for a full-time job uh, and that's actually when I got connected with the brick and tile maker uh, and he kind of like saved me from going to that corporate life because I was, I mean, this close to accepting a full-time job. Um, my, my baby was on the way, she was doing a couple of months and I got a, a pretty decent job offer, you know, it was like 75 grand a year for this sports company doing photo and video production stuff. and you know, benefits, paid time off, yada, yada, like, you know, the American dream. Yeah. But it was like an hour away in traffic each way, eight Oof. to five, Monday through Friday. <laughs> and it's like, really like that didn't fit my lifestyle at all. Yeah. But I thought because I had a baby on the way and I was a newlywed that that was something I had to do. And, uh, you know, like I said, luckily the owner of uh, Ardo Brick kind of came to my rescue and like, hey, like I want to produce more content. You need more steady income. Like what can we do together? And so that's kind of how that relationship uh, started to come together. 
Nice. So was there a switch or like a kind of a turning point decision that you made to say, okay, I'm going to transition my business away from real estate into say for designers and for custom home builders? Yep. Yeah, totally. Um, so when working with Ardo Brick, so to kind of give you a little more context there, again, I was about to take a full-time job. I had a baby on the way. I had just gotten married. Uh, you know, my wife was pregnant. She wasn't working at the time. So I've got a family to support. Um, so Ardo essentially paid me for part-time work, enough of a salary that I could, you know, support my family without doing anything else. So at that point, I didn't need to do anything else. Of course, I wanted to, um, but I had the freedom to kind of play around and figure things out. So, you know, if I wanted to sit around all week when I wasn't, you know, devoting my time to Ardo, I could. But if I wanted to figure out, okay, is there a new way to shoot real estate? Is there a different technique I can use? But again, through Ardo, I realized like, oh, I can work with the designers, architects. So the first thing I did was completely redo my website and got rid of every mention of real estate on there and just made a website that was, you know, for architecture and interior design. Sounds like um, what I and, did. <laughs> you know, once I, you know, swiped all the content and, you know, the copy on there, um, then it was like, okay, let's wipe out my email list, try to find a new email list to start sending out campaigns to and stuff and, you know, poking around on Instagram and seeing who else is out there. But also keep in mind, working with Ardo, they essentially put me in touch with a bunch of designers and architects and stuff because my job with them was figure out where their products went to, get in touch with that person and set it up to go shoot their space. So that was all on me. They didn't like arrange everything for me. That was part of my job for them. So, you know, either they would say, hey, this tile showroom sold tiles, uh, a bunch of them that we don't have a bunch of photos of, go track it down. So, um, you know, I could go to the tile showroom, say, hey, who'd you sell these to? Oh, so-and-so interior designer. Okay, track her down. Hey, wow. where did these go? Like this house, like, okay, great. Is it done? If so, can I come and shoot it? So, you know, networking and getting in touch with the designers and architects and stuff was part of that job, uh, which kind of helped connect me with them and sort of helped me learn their language and learn how to interact with them better. Because, you know, if anybody listening to this has ever dealt with different types of clients, like it really is a different style of communication, a different language that they speak and kind of a different way you market yourself and interact with them. Yeah. Yeah. Drastically different than real estate. That's for sure. Um, okay. So I, I want to kind of do, you know, the, the dive in, into the licensing part. Cause like I said, I, that seems to be somewhat of a mystery, somewhat of a, of a pond or that body of water that there's still a lot of photographers that seem hesitant to even dip their, their toes in. So I, you've been asked this before, I'm going to ask it again. So to, to someone who's completely new to the concept, how do you explain what licensing is to, to a photographer? Uh, I'm gonna try to put it in the simplest form possible. Sure. Um, and I will say this is my words, my opinion. Uh, I have a feeling the audience for this particular video is you know, a little bit more advanced, maybe not necessarily all beginners. Um, sure, so and by the way, I, I think you've said it before, anything we say concerning copyright or licensing, neither you or myself were attorney so none of this is actual legal advice so sure just for uh, warning good, good disclaimer <laughs> yes thank you so essentially licensing is uh paying for the rights to use a photo so for example uh, in the u.s when you take a photograph with your camera you own the copyright to that image there are instances of course that are exceptions to the rule like if you are an employee for a company and uh, or you have a contract that says your photographs or works for hire, in which case the other company might own the copyright. But for all intents and purposes for this conversation, when you take a picture, you own the copyright. Yep. If a architect hires you to shoot that photograph, they are paying you most of the time to license that photograph to market their own business. If another company, whether it be the interior designer or the cabinet company or the faucet maker that has work featured in that image, wants to also use that photo, they then have to pay a licensing fee to use it as well. And for the most part, you know, again, generally speaking, the licensing opportunities are endless. So let's take, for example, a shot of a kitchen. An interior designer hires you to photograph a kitchen. She licenses it, is that photo to use for her business, to market her company. You own that photo still. You can sell a license to the faucet maker, the cabinet company, the tile on the backsplash, the tile on the floor, the countertops, you know, the appliances, the ceiling, lighting, you name it, uh, the, the possibilities are endless. Other contractors that had a part in it, um, you know, the, the architect or the builder that worked with that designer, they could all also pay a license to use it. Just FYI, I, I 
put a, a thing on my, my Instagram story today saying that I was going to talk about uh, licensing. And I said, uh, I didn't say your name specifically, but I said, hey, I'm going to make another video about, uh, and this one's going to be about licensing. And I said, if there's questions about it, let me know. And then hopefully we can kind of work them in to this. And there was one that I thought was, was very interesting to kind of piggyback off of what you're saying. Their question is how best to display, I think they meant the word like present, what's the best way to present licensing to clients in a way that they can understand? All right, so the way I interpret that question is how do you communicate what a client is commissioning commissioning you to do exactly. is that kind of right. yeah because okay. in, in and the reason uh, this this person we went back and forth and i think they've had some some hiccups when it came to this so i i think even from my personal experience what happens is, is let's say you have client a client a being say the builder or the architect and there's no initial cost sharing it is just you know one single client commissioning you for a shoot you do the shoot you know say you deliver 10 photos it's all said and done and then after, say, a week, two, maybe a month or two down the road, you get the opportunity. Either someone reaches out to you or you do find out who maybe the countertop company was or who another company was was involved with the project. To, to a client who is not familiar with it, which I think most architects would be, but, you know, but let's say, let's say a custom home builder because not every custom home builder is. The one who hired you, the concept of licensing is foreign to them. How do you then present it to them in the smoothest way possible. Mm -hmm. So it's not to hit those bumps in the road. Sure. My um, best advice is have the conversation on day one. Yeah. So, um, and part of, partly for this reason, I actually try to schedule an in-person meeting um, for my first interaction. So obviously you might, you know, connect through Instagram, email or whatever, but before a photo shoot ever takes place, I like to meet my clients in person um, to have many conversations, you know, sidestep in here just to, to see if you vibe well to, you know, just kind of get to know each other, build a rapport so that it's not awkward on day one or anything like sure. that. But also to have these kind of conversations um, because even as, as recent as a few months ago, I even had a situation about this, which is embarrassing to say for me because this is the kind of stuff that I preach about all the time where a guy called me, he's like, man, I love your portfolio. Your work is great. I want to hire you. And like right off the bat, he hired me. We showed up, shot the photos and it was like, you know, done deal. It, it just happened very quickly. We didn't have yeah. that in-person meeting. A couple uh, months later or whatever, he calls up and says, hey, I'm confused. Like, I thought I own these photos. Like, why can't I give them to this other company? And it's like, okay, so we fast-tracked everything and kind of skipped over that conversation. So that- How did he find that out? How did he find that out from you? Hmm. Good question. I- Man, uh, maybe it was on Instagram he saw something. I wish I had the answer for you. And I, I don't know offhand. That's fine. Um, but I'm just curious. So again, have the conversation on day one. So when I sit down with a client, you know, it's not the first thing out of my mouth. But again, on day <laughs> yeah. one, uh, usually the way I work it in, actually, um, I'll just kind of give you like inside baseball here for me. The way I work it in is when I'm explaining my pricing. So inevitably, towards the end of the conversation, they're like, okay, let's talk about your pricing. I pull out my rate sheet. My pricing is based on a creative fee plus a licensing fee per photo. And I go on to explain to them, I'll basically explain to you how I do them. The reason I do that is twofold. One, so that if you shoot more, uh, you want more photos, you end up paying more. And if you don't need as many photos, you pay less. So you get what you pay for in this price structure. Two, because I want to have the conversation about licensing. When you commission me to photograph your project, you pay the price to show up. That's my creative fee. That's for me to show up with my gear. And then you pay a licensing fee per photo. So that means every photo that we create together will be delivered to you and you can use that photo to market your business. So with that said, you're paying to license that photo for your business, which means, uh, and the way I have it structured, everybody's different, but I give quote unquote unlimited use. So I say, you know, if you wanna put an ad in the Hawaii Home Remodeling Magazine, go for it. If you want to put on your Instagram, Yelp, whatever, if you wanna do print collateral, everything's fair game. That's in perpetuity. You never have to come back to me to ask me you know, permission again, as long as it's yeah. for your business. Now, if another business wants to use it, i.e. if the tile shop that you bought the tiles from comes to you and says, hey, can we use this photo? They would also need to come to me and pay a licensing fee as well. And, you know, just to be candid here, that is part of my business model. Again, this is me talking to the client. Sure, sure. Part of my business model is licensing photos to other vendors. So there might be times when 
I shoot a photo for you of a beautiful kitchen and the cabinet company wants to license that photo too. That is part of my business model. So, you know, I just want to be upfront with that so that there's no surprises down the road and that, you know, make sure that we're on the same page, you knowing that you're licensing it for your company and that if other companies want to use the photos, they have to also license them as well. Have you so, ever had with kickback all that said, from that? Oh, um, any kickback? Um, like someone not, goes, oh, well, we just want all the rights or right. You know, I, I'm just playing uh, devil's advocate here a little no, bit. No, no, for sure. Um, the only kickback I have is when I didn't have the conversation up front. Gotcha. Um, which again, pretty recently it happened. Um, the guy said, okay, like, what can we do about this? I don't like this arrangement. Um, even though those terms were listed on my deposit invoice, which serves as my contract to book the shoot, the same terms were listed on the final invoice when I delivered the images. Um, and maybe to answer your question, maybe that's how he, he saw it as maybe like after, you know, the final invoice was delivered, it, it kind of clicked to him because the terms were on there again. Um, so, you know, at that point he came back and was like, Hey, I, I don't like this agreement. What can we do about this? And I was like, okay, well, we've got a couple options. Um, you know, if you want to be able to give them to one extra company being, so this particular instance was a retail store that I photographed for a, a builder. Okay. It's like, if you want to be able to give them to the retail store, um, because we didn't have the conversation ahead of time, because you, you know, feel like you were not, not well informed, I'll add on just the 30% surcharge that I would charge. Uh, if we had agreed to cost sharing up front. If you'd like to do that and give it to one extra party, I'm happy to do that even though it's after the fact. Uh, if you want to buy the full rights, um, you know, and give them to everybody you want, then no problem, we can triple the cost and you can pay triple the amount and I'm happy to do that as well. You're talking and about like basically, full copyright buyout in that instance? So if I recall, I presented him with three different options. One was the 30% surcharge to give it to one extra party. Two was, uh, I think it was triple the price if you want to be able to distribute them to as many parties as you want. And then if you want to buy the copyright, meaning I don't own the photos anymore, yep. we can quadruple the price. To that, he said, sorry, I don't think I can do business with you. I said, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, you know, that, that, that's the way it is. So unfortunately, I lost a client who might've been a good client. Um, maybe he'll come around eventually. Um, but essentially if he wasn't willing to pay the rates that I wanted to get, then he's not an ideal client anyway. Yeah. Um, so that was one time it came to bite me in the butt. Uh, that was the pushback again. When I've had the conversations up front, we figure all that out before we ever shoot and it, it doesn't become an issue. Uh, the other time again was uh, a company that I didn't have the conversation with. This was a company I had shot for, no, no. I shot with them because they were a designer that worked with Ardo Brick, I think is what it was. Okay. Um, again, the, the company I was on retainer with. So I went into a space to shoot one of their spaces for Ardo. And my memory's a little foggy, so I think this is how it went. So then when it came time for me to actually shoot for them as their design firm, we didn't have that conversation because we kind of already had a rapport, but we just hadn't like dialed in what everything was. And they started giving out the photos to everybody. This was a, a commercial office space. And I mean, so many people started using their photos on Instagram, their website, like all these different things. And I was reaching out to every single one. And eventually um, one of them, I didn't send a DM to, and I posted a comment publicly that just said, hey, uh, you know, I'm glad you love this photo. I thought it was very polite, actually. I said, I'm glad you like this photo, um, but I didn't give you permission to post it in your feed. Please check your DMs because I had DM'd them and they didn't respond. Yeah. My original client saw that and was like texting me like, oh my God, I can't believe you did that. That's so embarrassing to us. Like, you know, we don't want to be thought of that way, you know, from our clients. We went back and forth. Uh, I said, I'm, you know, I tried to smooth things over. I explained to her the, the copyright. And I think this was through texting or something. I was like, I'm happy to jump on a phone call. Um, we had scheduled a phone call. She never showed up for the phone call. Um, I knew that I was moving in like two months. Um, I didn't pursue it. I didn't smooth it over as well as I should have. Yeah. But again, I feel like I attribute that to the fact that I didn't have that conversation ahead of time. Why, why is, you know, this is more of an opinion thing. I have my take on it too, but I mean, you're, I think you're more experienced. You might have your ear to the ground more so than I do, especially as the, you know, the licensing guy. But why are so many of our clients making the assumption that they can do whatever they want with it. What, what's your take on that? Uh, I think it's uh, just uneducation, a la lack of education, I should say. Um, you know, ignorance sounds like a harsh word, but if, by definition, I think it's just that they don't know any better. Yeah. Uh, I, I think they don't see it uh, the same way they would see buying software or 
buying a song on iTunes, or whatever platform. Um, I think they see it as almost like a hard good, you know? Like I think they view buying images like they would view buying an iPhone. Like once you have your iPhone, you can sell it to somebody else if you want. You can let your friend borrow it and give it back to you or whatever. Yeah. Um, that, that's kind of what I think. And, and I think they're just uneducated. And, um, you know, I know from experience with working with Ardo and for example, that designer that I just talked about, you know, part of their whole marketing strategy was to shotgun those photos and try to blast them out everywhere they can and get them spread as much as they can to get their name out there to as many places as they can. So, yeah, that's the, that's the tough part is when some of them make the assumption that they can do that and because their end goal is to spread their exposure or whatever yeah. and then you feel like the bad guy going, uh, well, not so fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it really but, is tough because it puts us as photographers between a hard place because there are, you know, I, I, I have a recent example where I, I took a photo for a company and then it got reposted by a big major national brand. From their perspective, they're stoked because now their project is in front of, in this case, well over 200,000 followers or whatever. And I think it got well over a thousand likes and stuff. And then, you know, and, and I'm at a loss because I, I haven't done anything at this point. I'm not sure what I should do because it's, it's just tough because you don't want to look like the bad guy, but then again, another company is piggybacking off of your product and it's helping out their brain. I think that's the other part a lot of companies don't realize is that, yeah, they're they're loving the exposure, but another company is doing this because it's helping out their branding as well. Mm -hmm. I, I think to that, um, the idea of a bad guy, like you don't want to feel like the bad guy, yeah. you know, telling somebody to stop. I think almost inherently like that's setting yourself up to make it a difficult situation because if you genuinely feel like you're doing something bad, then they're gonna feel like you're doing something weird or shady or something too. Whereas for me, like this is so ingrained in me that like this is the way it is yeah. that I don't feel bad about it. And I, I try to take emotions out of it as much as possible. I try to be as polite and professional and business-like as possible so that, you know, I don't feel bad about it. But I do wanna sidestep yeah. and, and take a step back real quick because I just thought of another time the pushback, which I think is a really good takeaway uh, for listeners yeah, what you got? that I'd like to share. So relatively recently, I got contacted by somebody in Australia saying that he was working uh, with an interior designer looking to set up a photo shoot uh, here, right in my town actually, where I live in Hawaii. Um, they were gonna be in Australia looking to have somebody photograph a property locally here that they had been designing throughout COVID just remotely or whatever. Okay. Um, you know, I, I showed them my race sheet, the terms, yada, yada. And essentially they were like, hey, you know, I don't think we can agree to these terms that you know, you'd be able to license the photos. So we went back and forth several times of, you know, okay, well, if you don't want that, you can pay more. If you want to be able to give them to whoever you want, you can pay more. We went back and forth several times and eventually they basically said, I don't think we're gonna be able to move forward. You know, we like your work, but we just, you know, can't agree to this. And it, it came down to the communication. Um, and luckily they were willing to have that communication because essentially I was just like, okay, what are your concerns? Like, what do you need? What do you not need? Yeah. Um, and what it boiled down to was that their client is, you know, some big famous rich guy in Australia that, you know, they're not allowed to tell me who it is and he's a private person. And at that point I was like, okay, well, I can make the decision. I can ditch him and just not have a client, but hey, I'm in a new market and, you know, I'm looking to make connections here. Knowing exactly what town it's in, it's, I don't know uh, if you're familiar with Lani Kai Beach, it's like one of the top 10 most beautiful beaches in the world. It's, you know, right here, like a couple miles from I where I've I live. Heard the name, yeah. It's, you know, knowing that it's in that town or like in that neighborhood is like, okay, it's a rich guy with an NDA in this town. It's probably going to be a really sick place to shoot. Sure. So, so at that point, uh, I essentially said, well, what if I agree that any photos that I potentially license, I will ask you first if it's okay if I license it to the tile company, the whatever company. And they agreed to it. So again, it was just that back and forth communication to really understand what their goals were, what their concerns were, what they're comfortable with and not comfortable with. Because a lot of times people have different understandings and different meanings of like what licensing, copyright, unlimited yeah. use, like blah, 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 blah. Like the list goes on, like all these terms, everybody has a different definition for. So if you can communicate clearly enough so that everybody's on the same page, they understand you, you understand them, maybe you can move forward. And with that project, not only did I go that day, they hired me for two extra days because it was such a big project. It ended up being three days um, and Dang. They did a cost sharing thing uh, on top of that because the owner might eventually want to sell the images. 
We don't know if he will or not, but he's rich enough that he's like, yeah, let's throw down the money anyway. <laughs> um, and I've already licensed, I think, three photos from the project. So, Dang. I mean, had I let that one slip through the cracks, like that's, I don't know, I, I don't know that off the top of my head, 10 or 11 grand or something like right yeah. there that I, I would have just thrown out the window. So you, you kind of met in the middle and said, hey, well, I'll still want to license it, but I'll run it by you first before I even attempt to do that. Yep. Is and that and nice? at that point, you know, I was okay with saying, if they say, no, you can't try to license this photo. Like, okay, cool. No problem. Like I've already got, you know, three days worth of shoots out of sure. it. And, well, I didn't know that at the time, but still like at the time I was thinking, okay, it's, it's going to be a nice property on the beach, like yada, yada. So I was, okay was it as that. awesome and, as you thought? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Nice. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure uh, it's if it's not on my homepage, it's in the top like row of my portfolio. Now. That's my next question. Is there a, P, a photo on your portfolio? So absolutely. Yep. So you have you, at this point, you've kind of like I said, you've kind of been known as the licensing guy. You decided to take on the role of an educator when it comes to photography and running your whole entire business. There's a ton of aspects. There's obviously the marketing, the finance, it, it, you know, the clearly obvious one is how to take a photo or how to edit. Why did you decide to narrow down on the field of, of licensing? Why did you decide to narrow down and teach that? Good question. Um, it kind of came by accident because I was under the assumption that everybody else was already doing this. Um, and one of the things that I got good at as I started to do it more and more, I get good at locating the right contact person. And at one point I threw out in one of the Facebook groups that I was active in, hey, I feel like I'm getting good at learning how to you know, contact the right person. Maybe I should make a quick little tutorial about you know, my tips and tricks of how to just find the, the email address for who I'm trying to reach out to. Yeah. And the overwhelming response wasn't, oh, that's a cool idea. It was, wait, you sell your photos to other people? <laughs> and I was like, oh man. Completely like, foreign, I, new concept. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so then I was like, well, maybe I need to help, you know, just take a step back and help them with the whole deal. And so once I, I realized that there was that need, um, I was able to team up with Jordan Powers, who's another photographer in the, the Midwest in uh, Minnesota. And he's kind of has, uh, you know, production background. And uh, he had made another course called the art of uh, real estate cinematography. So he understood the, the course type thing, because honestly, without him, like it never would have happened. Like, I'm, I'm not a you know, back in tech kind of guy, like the thought of, you know, making a Facebook ad, it just, it's, it's not for me. Yeah. Um, so I, I knew that I could come up with the material and I knew that what I was doing was working really well for me. And if other people weren't doing it, I felt like they were just, you know, leaving money on the table. And not only for them, like, you know, uh, yes, that is the number one goal, don't get me wrong, to help make, help other photographers make more money, sure. bring in more revenue for their business. But at the same time, like I really do feel like we're helping out these companies. Companies need photos and they need good photos. So the more that we can provide better photos for them, the better every catalog, better every website is gonna look. So I think it just helps out everybody. Yeah, that, that kind of, uh, that was another question I had is, how much do these, how much do the faucet companies, how much do the cabinet companies, the countertop companies, how much do these companies need the photos that we as, interior design and architect and home uh, builder photographers, how much do they need the photos that we create? More than you would think. <laughs> uh, short answer is more than you would think. There are certainly some that don't need the photos. Some uh, companies have everything done in-house. You know, they have staff photographers, they have studios, they do product shots. Uh, you know, somebody like Ardo uh, that had me on retainer, there might be situations like that. However, even when I was on retainer with Ardo, we still spent probably several grand a year, um, you know, licensing photos from other photographers. Wow. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's a lot more than you think. Um, there's a, tons of different areas besides just Instagram that I think we as photographers don't uh, realize that are there. And when you started thinking in terms of marketing, which again, I was basically like, you know, half of the marketing team at Ardo Brick for three years, you start to understand, okay, website, number one, no brainer, right? Instagram, we all know that. How about the other social channels? We've got LinkedIn, Pinterest, Google Business Page, Yelp, Howls, uh, Twitter. Uh, now that some of them are on TikTok. All right, online, cool, I get it. Um, how about print? Well, we've got magazine ad. Eh, are people doing that? Maybe, maybe not. But yeah. with Ardo, there was dozens of different brochures that would go to their dealers. Uh, these are printed you know, collateral pieces. Uh, price list that was like a, directly to dealers that wasn't consumer facing. A uh, big kind of like inspiration lookbook, you know, uh, inspiration book type thing that was consumer facing. 
um, point of uh, purchase displays that were in the showroom. So, you know, think of the, the tile store that sells their products. Well, now you've got like big signs and banners and stuff that you can put images on. Yep. Um, trade shows, I went to several trade shows with Ardo. They're giving out printed collateral there. There's, you know, images all over the, the actual booths. I mean, the, the amount of places that you can actually put images, email marketing campaigns, I mean, the list was just insane. Um, and so you have to look at how many places there are to put images, and then now, how are they gonna get the images? And once you start to ask yourself, okay, what are the different avenues that a company has to acquire a photo to go in you know, all these different places, then you realize like, oh, okay, like it makes a little more sense now. As, as an educator on the subject, obviously you're, teaching this to photographers who, you know, the concept is brand new. Maybe there's some who have dabbled a little bit in it. Is there one aspect to licensing that you have taught that you've gotten the most response of like eye opening? They go, wow, I didn't know that about the subject of licensing my photography. Probably, let's see, if I if I had, I don't know if I've like necessarily gotten the most response because I'm, I'm sure you can attest like as a content creator, you don't always get uh, feedback necessarily. You kind of put the content out there and hope that people are Only seeing it. Only if they right? hate it. Only if <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but uh, I would I would kind of break it down into probably three main things, uh, and I'm just talking this out loud. So number one is understanding uh, why they need the photos so that that really gets ingrained in you. Um, it's kind of what I call the licensing mindset of like. Yeah okay, let's reframe my brain in terms of, let's not just take a photo for my client, but let's think as I'm going through the shoot, as I'm going about my, my day-to-day activities as a photographer, how else can I monetize this image? So that's kind of number one is like the licensing mindset, I call it. Okay. Number two is how do you find the right person at that company to sell the images to? And then number three is how do you craft an email that is so perfectly worded that is going to maximize your chance for success in terms of getting your photos licensed. Um, because I think that's probably the number one thing that once people start realizing that they can do this, then the number one question is, what kind of email do I write? Like, how do I get yeah. them to see my email without throwing it in the trash, overlooking it, whatever. Because these people that we're reaching out to, they're getting blitzed with a ton of emails in general. Exactly. Not only internal yeah. ones or external, but yeah, probably internal ones too. Yeah. So are, are there aspects to it that you've gotten feedback where you kind of roll your eyes and you go, why didn't you know this already? <laughs> um, no, not necessarily because, you know, again, everybody starts at a different place. Sure. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to throw my personal opinion. And, yeah, and I'm, I was, I'm I was speaking, ask. It seemed like you had something yeah, in mind already. I, I think the biggest one is just knowledge of copyright. Because very, very early on in my career when I was doing it part-time I wrote up some stupid contracts and I didn't know any of the legal terminology I put in there just shy of giving away copyright it was like do whatever you want with it and then like you said um, you've mentioned several times of going in you know your your back catalog of looking at some old photos maybe you could license those and then looking at some of my contracts that I tied to those and just going I don't, I can't, I can't do anything. <laughs> so just knowledge of, of, I think, copyright and your, I guess, your, your rights as, you know, the owner of an image mm -hmm. to me. And, and every now and then I'll still hear, you know, I'll, I'll get a DM from someone look over Instagram and they'll just ask some questions that you're just kind of going, you, you're a photographer and you don't know this already. Not, not to berate them, but going, sure. man, if you knew this, you would be so much better more you know powerful and in, in or in as far as generating more revenue when you're for uh, for your income but mm -hmm. I, I will say now that you said all that one of the things that kind of um i guess shocks me for lack of a better word yeah. more frequently than i um thought is even after like teaching all the tips tricks and tactics and techniques um people still say uh, i don't have time or i can't find the time or i can't figure out how to make the time i can't figure out how to work this into my schedule um because you know I, the way I've laid it out in my course is like very systematized, systematic. Uh, systematic. I don't know the right word for that. Systematic. We'll throw it in the dictionary. <laughs> we'll make a submission. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've created systems and I've put systems in place in my workflow that allows me to get through this very quickly and efficiently. Um, and again, I'm not a high volume shooter. I'm not out shooting three houses a day and editing until 4 a.m. and doing it yeah. in the morning again. Um, so for me, um, you know, 
it's not a problem to do this. And I guess part of it is like, I don't mind sitting at the computer to, you know, do this kind of quote unquote admin work or whatever. Um, and so it, to me, it's surprising when people say like, I don't have the time. And it's like, if you spent that same amount of time to get a new client, that, you know, new photo shoot would be worth more than the two photos you just licensed. But you can do both, you know, like on your off day, like spend half the day trying to market yourself to new clients and half the day of licensing your photos. And both of them are gonna bring in revenue, you know? Uh, and so that's always surprising to me is when people say they just can't quite find the time. For someone who's new to, you know, say, because I, I don't think we've actually mentioned it specifically, but we'll, we'll dive a little bit more into it. But you do have a course, um, how to kind of, kind of from A to Z, how to go about doing this. Are there, say, say someone gets the course or say they even just, you know, want to try to go out on their own, try to license it. Are, for someone who hasn't done it before, what are some of the common obstacles that they'll come across in attempts to to license their images. Mm -hmm. Yep. So first thing is finding the right person. Um, you know, you're going to be looking for somebody in the marketing department or creative department uh, at the company. So locating that that person is you know a hurdle. Once you figure out uh, how to get that person's email address, uh, you might be met with silence for a while. Um, and I think a common mistake is kind of giving up. Um, like, oh, well, I emailed twice um, and I didn't hear back. So, you know, they don't want them, they're too busy, whatever. Um, that could mean one of several things. A, they're really busy, it got pushed down. Uh, or even before that, maybe your email is like not worded correctly. Maybe it's a little too overwhelming for them. It, maybe yeah. it doesn't include enough information that they can make a decision right there. Uh, and they've pushed you down to the bottom of their inbox because they don't want to go back and forth with the questions. Um, maybe you've pinged the wrong person. Maybe it's not the creative director, but the, you know, uh, marketing assistant, whatever it is, like, you know, person A versus person B. Um, so my take on that is uh, don't give up until you get a, a solid no. So yeah. um, again, t t for me, because I've put all these systems in place, and again, I teach these systems in the course, um, you know, following up on my emails is a copy and paste type thing. It's very easy for me to keep track of, have I emailed them one, two or three times? Um, you know, I keep a spreadsheet with all my contacts in there. Have I tried this person? Okay, if not, let me go to the next person and try that person. Uh, because, you know, I've made many sales where I sent three emails and then I finally got a reply back or sent three emails to one person, then reached out to the next person on the list in that same company, was able to make a sale to them. Or at least if they tell me no, then it's like, okay, well, I know this is the right person to contact for the next time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, finding the right person, uh, wording the email correctly, um, and I think those are two the, the two big things. Yeah. Are are there applications? Because obviously, being you know more for architects and shooting for builders, interior designers, are there applications outside of say our genre of photography that yeah. you went, whoa, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Um, so there was one cool one. So with the course, you know, we have a private Facebook group for the members. Um, one of the members of the course is a drone operator and does lots of drone stuff around his town. Um, and I think he was trying to shoot a, a photo of a building. Um, I don't think he's like specifically an architecture photographer, but for whatever reason he was shooting a building and a moving truck was in the way at this particular time. And he actually ended up licensing the photo to the moving company uh, that had their moving <laughs> truck awesome. in the photo. <laughs> That's yeah. great. So what, what he viewed as an obstacle actually made him more money. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, <laughs> there was another person that sold a, a few photos to a golf course as well uh, that we kind of had a little success story in the Facebook group. Yeah. I, I have, have there been like success stories that you've heard, you know, um, I mean, shoot, maybe not even someone who's purchased the course, but they've heard your interview because I think you've been on other videos and other podcasts. H has there been any feedback that you've just been blown away by maybe not necessarily just the sheer amount of money someone made, but like, you know, 50 images and yeah. I put my I, kids through college. Or something. <laughs> maybe not putting your kids through college, maybe not 50 <laughs> images in one in one go. But yeah, I mean, uh, you know, most of the feedback I hear is directly through our Facebook group. And that's kind of like where we share our, our tips and successes and stuff. Uh, but there's been tons of them in there. And, you know, it's not that I'm blown away by it because I expect that. Like, sure. I know, I mean, I do this stuff every day. Like, this year, I'm up to more than $50,000 in sales with 150 images at this point. Um, and so the stuff works, like I use it on a daily basis. I'm teaching yeah. people through the course exactly ABC what I do on a daily basis. So no, I'm not blown away by it, but it is awesome. And we do see a lot of success stories where, you know, people have sold, you know, handfuls of images and made thousands of dollars. Yeah, I will. I, I didn't want 
you know, the interview to just turn into a gigantic commercial for your no, <laughs> for your course. But that being said, um, I I think I came across the ad for it. It was either Instagram or Facebook. You know, the ads where it's I think you're holding the camera, and then I had licensed stuff to other companies before, but only when it was like really, really easy. Like I already had mm-hmm. someone's contact info or it was suggested to me, something like that. So I I got the course. You and I never communicated. You were just the guy on the ad. I go through the course and I'm just running through it, just loving everything about it. And you're like, you know, again, just going, oh, that's how you do that. <laughs> oh, that's, that's how you find out who's the right person to talk to. Um, so then I just out of kicks, I think this was around, I purchased it. It was either late summer or no, it was kind of cold. So here in Kansas city it was roughly late fallish. It wasn't quite winter. And I had already shot a house for a, a stager and it was a house that was for sale, but it was a beautiful house had been staged and I had shot just the living room. But in hindsight, I remembered they had this beautiful kitchen. So I contacted the stager who put me in contact with the builder and I said, Hey, Mr. Builder, I saw the, um, the house is still up for sale. I'm the guy who took the photos for the stager the other day. You mind if I go in again, um, just to take a couple more photos. I didn't grab any of the kitchen. And he said, yeah, it's, there's a real estate agent that's got an office set up there. Just tell him I sent you, no big deal. Take some photos, uh, found out who the appliance company was. Long story short, edited two or three photos. And then I get a, it was a GE company. I mean, I get a check in the mail from GE for several hundred dollars for like three photos. Paid for itself, your course, pretty yeah. easily <laughs> after, for, after you know one shoot. Yeah. So, and I, th- I think it was one of the photos that you, you critiqued, you did a thing where, um, yeah, you said, Hey, within the Facebook group, let's critique it. And you said, you said my photo was awful. No one should ever purchase it and <laughs> just delete the file immediately and cried a little I'm bit. Pretty sure I didn't say that. Did I? <laughs> <laughs> Classic Adam. <laughs> <laughs> um, along that li- along those lines though, of you asking to go back in there. Um, when I worked for Ardo, there were numerous times, like countless times, where I would go into a place by myself, whether it was because the interior designer just kind of let me in, ha- had free yeah. reign, or you know, similar situations. Um, and so I'm sure there's instances where a real estate photographer, an architecture photographer will be in a house by themselves and you know, get the shots on your shot list, but walk around like you're in this place, like yeah. you know, shoot other things. If you see something that catches your eye, you know, a product that stands out, like walk into a room and see like what jumps out at you in that room. Uh, or, you know, if, if you have been doing this a while and have companies that you've already sold to, you know, that might be the low hanging fruit. Like you walk in and see an appliance that you've sold, like your GE, like you see another appliance from that same company, like go shoot more yeah. stuff. And there's been tons of times when I shot more than I was asked to with the intention of possible licensing and or portfolio images. And worst case, you're going to get a little extra practice of, you know, becoming a better photographer. You might get a portfolio piece and you can very well license some photos that way. Yeah, I, I think um, I can't speak for everybody, other photographers, but if, if I ever am in a job and say we, we come up with a shot list and the client goes, OK, well, you know, there's no homeowner or maybe say it's a model house and they go, all right, I'll leave you to it. My eyes just light up because mm-hmm. I'm not I don't have a time constraint. I don't have a time limit. And then yep. not only do the do the shot list, but like you've suggested before, maybe now I take maybe a couple photos for myself that I'm going to use as that leverage to get in in front of these, uh, in front of these companies. Uh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll end with some, some questions that were sent to me via the, my little feeler I put out there. Uh, there was a photographer named, I'm not sure if you know this guy, Matt Delarue. He said, my question mm-hmm. is for a hundred dollars, who is Adam Taylor? Uh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I promised him I'd slip that in. Um, yeah. the other, another question was, yeah. How to engage relevant adjacent clients for licensing to broaden potential profits. Yeah, that, that to me sounds like the cost sharing, which, you know, Mike Kelly on, on AP Almanac wrote an amazing article about that a while back. Yeah. Um, that is kind of like everything you need to know is right there in that article. But, you know, essentially when you're talking to a client about, hey, we're going to be shooting this, uh, you know, kitchen and bath remodel, um, go ahead and ask them, did you work yeah. with an architect on this? Or if you're working with an architect, did you work with an interior designer that might also want to use these images? If so, let's you know get them involved and, and see if they want to help share the cost. It's a great way for you to maximize your budget. Um, and that's actually a phrase I like to use. So instead of saying, 
um, it's going to lower your cost. I always tell people it maximizes your budget. So essentially, if your budget for the year is X, Y, and Z, you're going to be able to do more photo shoots and get more images out of that same budget, um, as opposed to saying your price gets cheaper because you don't want to, you know, sound like your uh, your work is cheap or you know. Yeah. No, that's a great way to put it. Like uh, a, a thing I heard somebody say one time is never, even if you want to do stuff, you know, pro bono or whatever, never say you're doing it for free. Use the term like no charge. Like mm -hmm. I could charge you, but I'm just not going to do it this time. I but, like that. Uh, yeah. But speaking of too, so this is kind of a loaded question. I know you're not going to be able to give specific numbers, but one was how much should I charge per photo? Mm -hmm. Do you have a general rule of thumb? And I, I, some of the questions I got, I think were from photographers who are in real estate. Mm -hmm. And I would venture to guess some of the numbers that you've sold photos for would be, would blow away, you know, blow the minds of some of these real estate photographers because what they might charge for an entire shoot, I'm sure you've come across that you could sell one photo for that same exact number. So do you, do you have a general rule of thumb? Do you have a scale depending upon the company or what's your take on that? So uh, again, this is my take. Uh, and there's a couple of caveats that I need to say before I give you my take. Sure. One, keep in mind that I do this a lot. So it's a numbers game for me. I would prefer to go in with a price that I know they're going to say yes to, as opposed to try to negotiate. Um, also, I don't want to go back and forth about usage and contracts and this, that, and the other. Again, because as soon as you put those roadblocks, as I call them, in their face, they might stop. You might get pushed down to the bottom of their inbox. Once I have to deal with that, then it's going to put, get put on the bottom of my to-do list. So my whole philosophy with this, again, my personal philosophy, is make it as easy as possible for them and for me. So uh, with that said, everybody's at a different skill level. Some houses might be, you know, the, the rich guy in Lanikai on the water. Others might be, you know, a, a two bedroom, pretty nondescript house in middle America. So the types of houses uh, might look different, which might dictate a price range, more or less um, the quality of your image. With all that said, my go-to price is $350. Okay. Um, I've sold as little as 150. I've sold as much as 500 in this industry, more in other industries. Um, and for me, it seems like throughout all the negotiations, 350 seems to be that sweet spot that most companies don't really balk at. They don't necessarily try to negotiate too much um, and still feels very fair to me. Again, there's so many variables around that, but personally, that's the number I go in with every time. Yeah, I, I think that's might be a little bit of a mental hurdle because like for round numbers, say a real estate photographer took 20 photos and charged $200. Well, in their mind, they're charging essentially like, was it 10, 20 bucks a photo? And then if like, you know, a, a, a company came at them and said, hey, we just want to buy one, they might accidentally just go, oh, well, just one photo, that's, you know, 10, 20 bucks. Right. And I could see you just going... No, <laughs> just stop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you gotta, you gotta understand that the use uh, case for your photo, the type of company, the type of reach they have. So all that factors into it for sure. Yeah, and convenience too, because they didn't have to set yep. up the shoot. They, did, I mean, it's, they're 100%. getting all the benefits after the fact of seeing the image. Well, cool. Hundred percent. Well, we'll end it there, man. I, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. I really do. Um, I'm kind of stoked that you were able to do this because um, you know like i said you're, you're the guy that was teaching the course you're the guy on the ads and then now i'm on a zoom call with you so that's pretty awesome uh, cool. so uh if anybody wants to reach out to me i'm pretty accessible uh, my email's on my website and you know my instagram um and make sure i don't know if you want to put it in the video but we're going to give a discount yeah yeah please go ahead and mention AP it all yeah uh we'll give a discount of 40 percent off the course to Dang. ap almanac listeners so just type in the promo code ap almanac all one word um, at the checkout and you'll get 40% off the course. Awesome. Sounds good, man. I'll put uh, your Instagram up there and your, your website on the screen and stuff. So cool. again, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate you doing this. You're welcome, dude. Good talking to you. All right. Same here, Adam. Take care. Later.